Wow. When we're talking about the last days and what's coming up, this is it, actually mercy. Because God's given us an opportunity to get right with him. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. And without having that relationship, there's an empty part of you that you'll try to fill and try to fill with things, try to fill with prosperity, try to fill with, with popularity, whatever you're trying to accomplish. But you're going to find no matter what you gain, you're still going to be empty. There's a God that loved you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins. Now, every single human being has a problem. They have a sin problem. And sin is actually, sin is breaking God's commands or breaking or transgressing God's transgressing God's laws. And the Bible says that the wage of sin is death. And we could take that kind of lightly. It's not just meaning that you're going to die physically. It's that you could die spiritually and be separated from God for eternity. Have you ever thought about eternity? We've had some members of our church this week pass on to eternity. There was a man that I saw the last two weeks coming and he's crying and giving his life to the Lord. Thank God we're open because this week he passed away. There's a young man in our Pomona campus that got shot five times in the face. We're praying right now that he lives, he gets through this and it comes out with the testimony. He's still alive. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. We're living in a broken world. I'm just telling we're living in a broken world. I, I told you a few weeks ago, I'm driving up this street hallmark and there's a motorcycle accident. And there's a young man that's bleeding and I found out he's bleeding to death. I stopped and I prayed with him. I began to share the gospel with him. A few hours later, he goes on to eternity. We need to be thinking about how short our time is on earth. And we definitely, if there's anyone that's thinking about eternity, it should be us. If there's anybody that should be aware that our time on earth is short, it should be every one of us. We are the light in this dark world. We are, we are the salt of the earth. That means that we're the ones seasoned in this world with truth, with love, with the good news of Jesus Christ. There's only one name to call on for man to be whole, to be forgiven, and one sacrifice that was made for all mankind, and it's Jesus Christ. And unless someone calls upon the name of the Lord, they will not be saved. Religion cannot save you. Your good works cannot save you. But the question is, are we in the last days? We covered this before. You're in the last days one way or the other because your life on earth is very short. And after you die, the Bible says that each man is appointed a day to die. After that is judgment. Jesus, the Savior that came and died for you, either he's your Savior, but if you reject him, one day he'll be your eternal judge. And after you leave this earth, it's too late to make decisions. You're going to leave with the relationship you have with Jesus or the lack of relationship you have with Jesus. But if you leave here with a relationship with Jesus, you'll have one for eternity. If you reject Jesus and you continue saying, I just want to live how I want to live according to my own rules, my own ways. I set the standard. I set my own morality. You could do that. But one day you stand before God and you'll be judged by your rejection. Today, Jesus comes one more time and he says, I know you're searching for meaning. You're searching for love. You're searching for freedom. You're searching for sanity. You're searching for peace. And there's only one name that you could call on that could change your heart, change your mind, make you whole, forgive you, and give you eternal life. This is all good. But today we're going to be covering end time. And I would just say end time sign number six. And we're going to be talking about a massive moral decline. Now, this is a very tough subject. Because if we don't talk about details on more immorality, then what I'm leaving everything, I'm leaving it up to guessing. And, and it'd be a shame that we go to church and sin and immorality is never mentioned. So it becomes a generality. 
there's some people in this room right now, you're struggling with a sin, and if we don't graphically, intentionally mention it, you might think it's okay. I'm, as a pastor, I'm not here to win a political vote. I'm not here to be the most liked guy. I'm here to love you, share the word of God with you, and let God do the miracle. Everything that we're covering today is not judgment. It's warning. But it's also correction and it's teaching. When we're talking about immorality, let's look at this scripture and it describes the disciples asked, what are, one of the, what are the signs? And this is one of the signs that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, 3. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? So Jesus was beginning to discuss this subject. There's the end to the world as we know it. There will be a time of judgment. There was a time where Jesus came and it was prophesied. And he came and he left. And Jesus Christ is coming back. And then there's going to be judgment at the end of the world. And every single person here will stand before Jesus and be judged. And either you have believed in the sacrifice that God has given for your sins, which is Jesus that he took the punishment that you and I deserve, or you'll have no sacrifice and you'll be the sacrifice. But one way or the other, the sin will be paid for for eternity. So he's asking, the disciple says, what will be some of the signs of the end of the world? And then Jesus said in verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. So what Jesus was saying, there'll be an increase of moral, immorality and sin. Sin will be rampant everywhere. Let's think about that. What does an immoral last day society look like? Sin is spreading like wildfire. The word sin means willful disobedience. That we live in a world that would not be disobedient, but they would be arrogant in their disobedience. They'll have some contempt. Contempt means open disrespect for order, law, and God. It wouldn't just be a sin, but they would really disrespect, dishonor the Bible, God, and it would be an arrogant sin. sin. We're living in a world today that people easily will say there is no God. And just take God right out of the equation, even though there's a creation. Even though we know there's right and wrong. But why would they do that? Because they love their sin. It would mean heartless. They'd become heartless. It would be, they'd become mean, unethical, spiteful, vicious, wicked, and a condition without law. We don't want law. We don't want order. We don't want police. We want no authority. We want nobody to tell us what to do. We want to be our own gods. Wow. Would that be the condition? Sin will be rampant. And that word rampant means this, growing as weeds, unchecked. We're living in a world that no, there's no checks and balances. Because we're, this is what we're doing. We're eliminating all authority. We've taken... We've taken the Constitution even to say this. Our forefathers said this, separation of church and state. And we don't even know why they wrote that. They wrote that so the government would not interfere with the church. They did not write that so we'd have a government with no church. And that's why our forefathers said, one nation under God. God was always, in your, in your dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. God was always supposed to be part of our morality. God was always supposed to be part of understanding what's right and wrong. And what we've done is we've taken God out of 
state, but we've taken God out of our homes. We've taken God out of our personalities. We've taken God out of our, our personal life. We've taken God out of our decision making. So now it's unchecked. It's excessive. That word rampant means excessive. Flagrant. Spreading. Unbridled. It'd be an epidemic. It'd be widespread. And what we've seen is some of you only know what you've seen in the last 10, 20 years. But some of us have been around for a little longer like me. And I've seen the massive moral decline of where we're at now. There's sins that we're celebrating now that we would have been ashamed of years ago. You wouldn't even dare say you were involved with it because it was a conviction of right and wrong. But the Bible says in the last day, sin will be rampant and it would be wild and it would be unchecked. And there's almost, almost an arrogance like, don't you dare check me. Who are you to judge me? It's not judging you. It's sharing truth with you. You could do whatever you want with the truth. You could believe it. You could repent of your sins. Your life can be changed. You can receive eternal life. Or you can just throw it in the trash. But there's one thing that we can't do. We can't keep our mouths shut because we are the only standard of truth. So it says sin would be rampant, it would be, it would be spreading. But this is very important for you to get and understand. And this would determine if you're a believer or not. Is that you're getting your worldview from the Bible, not society. So God is the one that defines what is sin, not us. As believers, we get our worldview from God's word, not our opinions, society, textbooks, our emotions, lifestyles, teachers, professors, news, media, your political affiliation, laws. All other sources are undependable and they move in target. My opinion is just as good as yours. Therefore, our opinions cannot be our authority. Our definition of what's right and wrong comes from the highest source. God's word, God's standards don't change. What he says is sin and what he said was sin is still sin. I get my standards, my values, my morals, not from my cousin, not from my mama, not from YouTube. I get it from the word of God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, you must believe this. All scriptures inspired by God. You must believe that every single scripture came from the mouth of God. That word inspired means it was breathed out of the mouth of God. You cannot believe that part of the Bible is correct and part of the Bible is not correct. Because if you believe that, the Bible has no authority over your life. Because you'll pick and choose your morality. And that's how sin becomes rampant. There is no structure. There is no order. God's word, I could take it or I could leave it. Or you could take on a, a philosophy. The Bible was written by man, therefore it has mistakes. And I would say this, I've read the whole Bible. There are no mistakes. What are they? I've been challenging people for years. What are they? Well, uh, 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 yeah, exactly. You're just saying that as an excuse to justify your lifestyle. But understand, there is a creator, and he has set an order, and he's determined what's right and wrong. And we get it from the word of God. The Bible says. I'm not being mean. I'm trying to help people get saved. You don't love people if you just, if, if you just, let them think they're okay and they're going to get hit by a train. Well, I'm just trying to be tolerant. You cannot be tolerant of sin. You must address it with love. 
But it's not okay for someone to be involved in a sin that will destroy their lives, separate them from God, get them full of demons, and send them to hell for eternity. And you're sit, sitting there watching, knowing the word of God, and you say nothing. I just love you. Love them and tell them the truth. But they might not like you. They might not like you for a moment. You might be, be persecuted. The Bible says that will happen. But God is saying, do you love? Come on. Come on. Do you love the people? Because if you love them, you'll lay down your life for them. Even if it means you looking stupid, persecuted. Even if it means that you're not in with the crowd. But you love God. And one day, you'll be held accountable. And you'll be able to say, I did all I could. All scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful for this, to teach us what is true, to teach us what is, to teach us truth, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. We look at the word of God and it's a mirror. Do you have a mirror in your home? Why do you have a mirror in your home? Because you want to see if you're in order. Because until you look in the mirror, your hair's out of order. Your face is out of order. Come on. And then what you do with a mirror is you adjust your life to make sure it looks like it's supposed to. The word of God is a mirror. You don't tell the mirror is a lie. It's just telling you this is how you look right now. These are the standards. These are the morals. You don't change the mirror. You change your look. You adjust yourself to the word. You don't adjust the word to your life. All scripture is inspired by God is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So the word of God corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. So it shows us what is truth, and it shows us clearly what's right and what's wrong. And what I love about the word of God, it doesn't change. Society changes, laws change, but God's word does not change. And God's word still 100% works. And you can fight against the word of God, but in the end, you're going to find out the word was right and you were wrong. So what are the major causes for, for, for moral decline and sin becoming rampant. What, what is the major reasons that this has happened? One, the standard that we are using for morality is subjective. The standards we're using are subjective. And subjective means this. In other words, individuals define what is moral and immoral for themselves in their own unique situation. There's no standard. I decide what's right or wrong. That's being subjective. There are no commonly accepted standards of behavior. The objective standard of right and wrong creates a lot of problems in our society. It means that what is good or bad for one person can differ from what, is, what it is for another. What this means is there's no absolutes. So the reason sin is rampant, we're looking for morality in humans, groups, and society, you determine what's right and wrong. And there's a problem. As we talk to each other, we all have our different opinions. There might be somebody that thinks being with little children is right. I'm in love. They love me and it's consensual. Why not? What we're living in, I want you to understand, we're living in a society that that's, if you don't believe in absolute truth, you're going to have to agree with that person. You have to agree with them because that's your philosophy. Because you cannot make up your own standards. Where are you getting your standards from? If you're getting it from yourself and you're getting it from society, then you determine, if I believe that sleeping with children is okay as long as it's consensual, what, who are you to tell me? That's my opinion. getting quiet in here. Come on, are we living in these days, though? Come on, are we, are we going crazy? Now, I'm going to introduce you to a philosophy of thinking. And a philosophy of thinking is ethical relativism. Ethical relativism. And this is all it means. And either you 
you're, you're a relativist or you're an absolutist. I'll say it again. Either you're a relativist or you're an absolutist. And what's a relativist? It describes a position that what is good or bad changes depending on the individual or group. And that there are no moral absolutes. This is what the relativists say. There's no moral absolutes. How funny. That is an absolute. You're saying there's no moral absolutes? Are you absolutely sure? Because that's an absolute. Relativists believe that what is right and wrong is determined by culture and or individual belief. And there are no universal laws. Is that true? That there are no universal laws? That's not true. They, are, they, are, they argue that there is no definite, there's no definite definitions of right and wrong. And this is what it does. It gives us the freedom to make God in our own image. And a society that reflects us instead of God. It creates a lawless mindset that leads to a lawless society. That means if there's no right and wrong, then all, what we'll do is what we'll make all the laws and all the rules to reflect my lifestyle. And God says, I created you in my image. I've created to reflect me, not reflect yourself. Satan, what he wants is his image in this world, and he's lawless. And we are, when we are relativists, and I'm telling you this, if you are a relativist, you cannot be a Christian. If you are getting your standard from society, from, come on, from, from, your, from the textbooks, from your professors, from YouTube, and you're not getting your, your morals and your values of right, wrong from the word, you're a relativist. The American compass is in decay. What is moral and what is not clearly def what is moral and what is not clearly defined, but sadly, countless of Americans these days are choosing to redefine the meaning of morality in order to justify their self-indulgent, hedonistic behavioral lifestyle. So the reason I want to set my own standards is I don't want to repent. I want you to accept me for who I am. And God says, I don't accept you for who you are. And that's why I came to make you into a new person, to set you free, to cleanse you of your sin and give you a new identity. Now you come the way you are, but you don't stay the way you are. Any gospel out there that tells you to stay the way you are is a false gospel. It's actually a demonic gospel. Now, this relativism, it creates a cancel culture. Relativism has created a cancel culture. In relativism, behavior is determined by one person or a group of people with similar beliefs. So decisions of what's moral, right, and wrong are created by people with similar beliefs and creates a culture that anyone who goes against the mainstream may be shunned by society and edited or canceled on social media or anywhere else. Right now, as we're speaking this, there might be some YouTube, YouTube might flag us. And say, this is hate speech. Because they're saying right and wrong. And they could shut down our YouTube channel right now because of what we're saying. Because we're living in a cancel culture. It's all relativism. You're not conforming to our idea of what right and wrong are. As a matter of fact, you're wrong. See, being a Christian nowadays is going to be different than it was 10 years ago. If you're going to stand for God and really love people, you might just need to get persecuted. Come on, are you willing to get persecuted? Are you willing to lose it all for someone to get saved? God is saying, you're the only standard. If we say nothing, no one will know. 
See, cancel culture. Cancel culture says that if, God, if you go against the prevailing norms, you may be canceled. If you don't agree with, with the norms and the values and the ethics of our society, we'll cancel you out. We'll fire you. We'll shut your voice down. We're living in a world that sin is rampant. How many understand that? So what are the major causes of moral decline? One is the standard that we're using for moral morality is subjective. Number two, we are no longer using the word of God as our standard for morality and guide for life. We are not supposed to be relativists. We're supposed to be absolutists. The word of God must be our guide for absolute truth and the standards of right and wrong. God's word is absolutely 100% dependable and will never fail. And it never changes. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. We've got something that we can stand on. We're right. It's right. Remember this. This is not hate speech. What this is right now is truth because we love people. Sin leads to death. Sin leads to depression. Sin leads to bondage. Sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to destroyed families. Sin leads to mental health issues. Sin is at the end will lead to hell. Why would we not talk about and define what truth is? In Psalms 119, 105, it says this. Your word is like a lamp that guides my steps. What guides my steps? What guides your steps? Come on, are you a believer in this place? Where do you get your morality from? Where do you get right and wrong from? It's the word of God. The word of God directs my steps. It shows me what's right and wrong. Even if I don't feel it, I obey it. As we're talking about this, this word might rub you the wrong way because your lifestyle doesn't agree with it. And either you're going to accept the word, repent of your sins, come to Jesus, be saved, and experience eternal life, or you're going to reject it. You're going to reject it, but understand you won't change, and at the end you'll be judged by your decision. Your word is a lamp that guides my steps, a light that shows the path I should take. So the word tells us what path I should what? It does. Proverbs 30, verse 5, verse 30, verse 5 and 6 says, you can trust this. Say it with me. You can trust this. Every word that God speaks is true. It's 100% dependable. God is a safe place for those who go to him. So don't try to change what God says. Well, I think God says, no, don't try to change it. It's straight. Well, it's all dependent interpretation. No, this is what it says. Don't change what God says. How are you going to interpret that? If you do try to change what God says, he will punish you and prove that you are a liar. Well, I don't believe that what God says is true and I don't believe that scripture. And God says, you can do what you want. You'll be punished at the end and everyone will know you lied and you were wrong. Now we also, the third reason why Sin is spreading the way it is. We live in, we live in a media culture. It's, it's crazy because before this social media, you have to understand, it wasn't so long ago where there was no such thing as a cell phone. I lived in those days. For some people, like, really? <laughs> yeah, I lived in those days. It was a beeper. And that was it. And usually drug dealers had the beepers. The regular, most of us couldn't afford a beeper. Or we didn't even know how to use it. There's a beeper. Get a little text. That's it. And then they came out with a, a cell phone, but it was this big. So like, it was like, I mean, it looked like a clown. I mean, just... And they used to show them like on movies in, in big, huge Eldorado Cadillacs, and there was usually a pimp in the car. <laughs> big old phone like this. 
But I want you to understand this. Sin couldn't be rampant, and I'll tell you why it couldn't be. There was enough exposure to sin. Spread is, sin is spreading like wildfire because of the major exposure. The average American spends 1,300 hours on social media a year. The average human spends two hours and 27 minutes a day on social media. So we're living in a world that a YouTuber, a TikToker could be demonically influenced and be, and be training your kids on demonic doctrine. can be converting your kids into a lifestyle. They, there's a community that they could be part of that's demonic on social media. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, so it said latter times, some will depart from the faith. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. The majority of the messages on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram are actually teachings of demons. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you a, a video right now real quick. And it's a video about the pronouns that we have today. You know, it used to just be two pronouns, he, she. That was it. Two years ago, there was 33 different genders. Last year, there was like 75 different genders. And today, there's up to 112 different genders. So what's the genders? I mean, gender, I mean, there's all kinds of genders. You could identify as a male. You could identify as a female. You could be a transgender man, a person who has assigned female at birth but now identifies as a man. You could be a transsexual, a person who emotionally and psychologically feels that they belong to the opposite sex. Transsexuals are people who transition from one sex to another, usually through dress, hormone, therapy. You could be agender. This literally means without gender, so a person who doesn't identify with any gender. You could be intergender, people who have a, a, a gender identity that is in the middle between the binary genders of female and male, and they may mix both of them. You could be pangender, a person who identifies as more than one gender. Or you could be trigender, translates into three genders, a person who shifts between male, female, and a third gender that we don't even know what it is. And I want you to understand this. I'm not making fun of this. I'm just telling you this is where we're living. And you say, what's going on? We're living in a world that sin is rampant. And this is one of the signs that sins are going to be rampant. We're going to start redefining what God's already defined. Why would God, why would he want us to redefine what God's already defined? Because Satan knows about identity. He goes, and if you identify yourself wrong... You could be lost for eternity. There's only one identity that's going to get you into heaven is that you become a child of God. That's it. And you're going to have to call things the way God calls things if you want to end up in heaven. You cannot get set free from a sin that you're not even admitted as a sin. Satan knows what he's doing. It's all deception. And, I, and what, why all this deception? Satan does not want you to conform to the word of God, obey the word of God. He wants you to be a child of disobedience. It's all about your eternal soul. This is not about your identity. It's about Satan giving you a false identity. It used to just be I'm a gangbanger. It used to just be I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a player. But now, saying goes, I'm going to take this further. I'm going to destroy ev all evidence that there was a God that created man and woman. And I'm going to confuse them. Everything that God defined, I'm going to undefine, including gender and marriage.
All right, we still with me? Now, let's take a look at this. Now, we've gone so far that people have actually used pronouns like this, they, for themselves. As soon as I heard that, you're saying you're a they? You're admitting that you have multiple personalities for sure. And this is what's happening is that demons no longer want to, remember this is blatant. Demons no longer want to be in the background. They want to be in the forefront. I want to walk through you. I want to talk through you. I want to be identified. I'm here too. We're here too. Identify us. We're going to get to the point that people are actually, their personalities are going to be more demonic than human. Let's take a look at this video about pronouns. So Leona uses they, them pronouns. In so Leona uses they, them pronouns and demon pronouns. So the first sentence would be, Leona is my partner, they are cute, and I am theirs. I love them very much, and I hope they love themselves too. For the demon pronouns, it would be, Leona is my partner, demon is cute, and I belong to Dean. I love Demon very much, and I hope Dean loves Demon's self, too. And then interchanging the two would be, Liana is my partner, they are cute, and I am Dean's. I love Demon very much, and I hope they love Demon's self, too. Now, I want you to understand this. You cannot be okay with this. And if you're okay with this, you're a relativist. And I'm going to tell you this, you're not going to heaven. And there's a church somewhere that will tickle your ears and make you feel like, hey, everything's okay, hunky door. But at the end, your name will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your family won't. Your kids won't. Your daughter and your son won't. And I understand maybe some of our kids are suffering with this stuff because they've been exposed by it. But you're not loving them by accepting the sin that they're associating with. You got to tell them, baby, I love you. And I love you enough to tell you the truth that you are a man, you are a woman. That's who you are. That's who God defined you to be. And all these other false identities are not you. And I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. No, not here. Now, I want you to get this. This is already in the school system. This is already California law. How? How can this be law? This don't even make sense. But sin will be rampant. And morality will be determined by people, not God anymore. Wow. We got a lot of work to do. How many of we got a lot of work to do? I can't even get into this next thing because I got to develop it. Okay. Next week you got to come. We're going to go into this. You're gonna, we're going to go deeper into it. We go, next week we're going to get canceled, I think. Just, Facebook's going to like, I mean, we might end up on channel CNN or something. I, because we're going to, right now we're going to face this antichrist spirit. Look him in the eye. And I'm going to tell you this. I love, oh, come on. I love, I love those that are transgender. I love the homosexual. I love, come on, I love the sinners out there. But I'm going to tell you this. I love you enough to tell you the truth so you can repent and get saved to receive eternal life and receive the new life that God has for you. Come on, we're not going to be a last day church that's falling away. We're going to be a church that's standing up for the standards of God, preaching the Bible so someone can get saved. Come on, are you with us? Come on, are we in this together? Love you. Stand up, please. Next week, we're going to cover is homosexuality a sin. We're going to cover that next week. They don't get deep in here. We're going to cover it next week. 
And, and you know what, Pastor, why would you cover that? The reason I cover that, because if we don't cover it here, your daughter, your son could be struggling. And they never even heard it in church. And if they never heard it in church, where, where, where are they going to get the right and wrong from? They have to get it from the word. So we're going to find out what the word of God says. That's all. We're not going to be judged. We're just going to say what the word of God says. I'm going to tell you what the word of God says. We'll go from there. All right. And you could believe it or not and determine what you want. And hopefully you agree with the word and don't become a relativist. There's only two groups, relativists and absolutist. You guys understand that? I, I just want to say this. What's an absolutist? They believe that there are many cultural norms endorsed by society, but it doesn't make these acts moral or there are, and there are absolute rights and wrongs whether we agree with them or not. Absolutism says that if something is wrong, it is always wrong. That's what it means. If something's right, always right. Because our standard is a word. We could be absolutist because we have us, we have a source of truth. How many go, how many know that? All right, awesome. Before we leave, I'm gonna dismiss in just a second. How many receive from God here? You don't want to uh, Sunday, you wanna come Sunday. I'm gonna give you some keys to growth. You wanna come Sunday, you wanna get some keys to growth. God does has never created anything without growth in mind. And wherever you're at right now, God wants you to grow spiritually, wants your relationships to grow, wants your peace to grow, your joy to grow. We're going to have to tie in and understand you're not supposed to be next year in the same hole. It's okay to start off in a hole, but it's not, it's not okay to end in the hole. It's okay to start small, but you should have some graduation and increase in your life. Come on. Increase. More people saved. You're, come on. There's people coming with you. You're influencing the city. You're influencing your, your family. Come on. They're not all saved, but somebody needs to get saved. You're a light. Amen? All right. Before we leave, I want to give an opportunity for every single person to do the most important thing you could ever do. And that's a call on Jesus to save you. In Acts 2.38 says, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your own sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Only then. There has to be a day that you say, okay, I admit I'm sinning. And if there's someone who says, well, I don't, I'm not sinning, the Bible says he who says he has no sin is a liar. Everybody's sin. Come on, everybody. Come on, we've been filming you. Next week we're going to show some of it. I'm just kidding. But God has made this very simple. Just like that kid Anthony that's dying on homework. Just call on Jesus. Be willing to turn from your sin. And you say this, Pastor, I, I, right now I'm addicted to this, I'm addicted to that, or I, I don't feel like I'm ready. I, I'm going to tell you this, you'll never be ready in the sense of feeling ready. Don't wait till you feel ready. Get ready. I mean, you got to move on by your, you cannot be, make your feelings your God. You got to finally get to the point, it's right and it's wrong. And the anger that I have, the sin I've been involved with, the addiction I've been involved with, the sexual morality I've been involved with, it's sin. It's keeping me depressed. It's hurting me. It's hurting my family. It's very selfish. It's destroying my identity. And I'm tired. And I know this, that if you continue living in your sinful lifestyle, you know what your sin is. I, knew, I know this. Your relationships won't work. Your emotions won't work properly. You're going to be majorly dis dysfunctional, and you're going to have open doors to great depression, fear, anxiety, and nothing will ever change. You're going to be a slave to your sin that you're giving yourself to. I'm telling you, it's all a lie. Just one more run. You might not have another run. I'm just telling you. We, we, we're, we're getting people, that last week, we had two people died in our, in our church that were here last week. Maybe even in this service, they're gone. And I pray that you're ready. We're in the last days. And I pray that the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. Shows you that you're a sinner. Not to condemn you, but convicts you to make you realize, I'm a sinner and I'm in trouble and I need a savior. 
Because if you never get that, you'll never be saved. You could be in this room and be checked out mentally. But I'm telling you, if you're in here checked out mentally, there's a devil that's trying to keep your thoughts from this moment so you could get saved, be set free, be filled with God's spirit, be forgiven, and be given the gift of eternal life. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life, and your new beginning can start now. Come on. Serving God is all good. Some of say it's all good. It's good. I'm going to count to three. If you're saying, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm right with God, but I want to repent of my sins today. I want to admit that what I'm doing is sin. I need God to help me to overcome it. But I want change today. I want salvation today. I want eternal life today. I want to be on the right side, and I want to be in right standing with God. God has made a way for you to be right with God by faith and grace. You know what it means? Unearned. Just receive it. It's a gift. Someone say a gift. Jesus paid the price. It, it costs you nothing, but it cost him his life. Why did he die? Sin demands death. Suffering. Shedding of blood. Back in the Old Testament, if you sin knowingly or unknowingly, you were still guilty. But once you found out that you were guilty, you'd have to bring a goat Lay your hand on the goat as a sign of transferring your sins to that goat and killing that goat. <laughs> and then the priest would take the blood of that goat to represent you to the Father. But how many know go goats and lambs and bulls can't save you for eternity? But Jesus, the Lamb of God, came, shed his blood on your part, put all your sins on him. That if you believe in him, you, come on, you're not condemned, you're not judged, you could be saved. One. If you say, Pastor, that's me. I want a new start. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven of my sins online. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Today's your day. Come on. God has made it clear. I'm the standard. Follow me. I'll save your life. I'll make you new. I'll give you what you're looking for too. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I'm right with God, but I want to get right with God. I want to repent of my sins. I want to be saved. When I say three, raise your hands over this building. No one can get saved for you. You got to make up your mind. You need to make a decision. No one's going to get to heaven by accident. It's a choice. Come on. One, two, three. Raise your hands over this building. Say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see the hand. I see the hand. Come on. I see the hand. Come on. I see those hands there. I want those to raise their hands. I want you to come forward real quick. Online, if you raise your hand, come forward. Come on. There's somebody right now that you've been struggling with homosexuality, and today you're going to get saved, and God's going to give you the strength to have a new life and new desires. Come on. You're going to be free. You're going to have joy. Everything that you've been looking for in those relationships have left you disappointed, hurt, and lonely, and there's a God that's not here to judge you, but here to save you and give you a new life. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand. Someone's giving their life to Jesus today. Awesome. Christian, come up here. Anybody else? Ask your neighbor, you want to go up there? I'll go up there with you. I'm telling you right now, this could be the last service. These last day services are a trip because the Bible talks about that the last days would be revealed in the last days. Like what would happen in the last days would be revealed in the last days. The fact that we're talking about the last days right now is that God is saying we're in it. This is your day. Come on, they're still coming. Come on, someone's, someone's fighting a demon and saying, not now, tomorrow. Not now. God said, no, right now. Right now is your day to get set free. Right now is your day to feel the love of God. Right now. Come on, Jesus loves you. All he wants is a relationship with you. Come on, church. Come on, people are getting saved. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. This is why we give. This is why we serve. This is why we prepare. This is why we preach the word. I get my worldview from the word. What's right and wrong from the word? It's your day. All right. Pastor Christians, lead us in prayer. Your next step is repent. Go all in and get baptized. When you're getting baptized, you're saying this. Go in the water, you're saying, the old me's dead. I'm living for Jesus. And I want everybody to know publicly, 
The person I used to be, I'm no longer that person. I've given my life to Jesus. And then you start coming to church. Come on, Christians go to church. Become, Christians become students. And this, this is our school. We learn the word. And then we can live it. You've exposed, come on, we've exposed ourselves to so much social media. God is saying, come on, you got to expose yourself to my word. So you can be like me. Think like me. Walk in power like me. Come on, it's time to grow. Proud of you. Proud of you. Come on, let's give them a hand. I'm proud of every single one of you. Congratulations, Pastor Christian, Christian, let's go ahead and pray. I'm going to receive the word tonight. Who's ready to surrender their life to Jesus? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's pray. I want you to repeat after me. What you're going to say from your heart right now, you're saying to the Lord. And his eyes are right on you. Say this to God. Say, dear Lord, forgive me for living my own way. I know I've sinned and I've fallen short from your standard. But because you sent your son to die on the cross and to raise from the dead, because of that, I can be saved. So right now, I put my faith in you, Jesus. I believe that my life can change because of your love. Make me a new person. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you. I repent. I turn away from my old ways. And I turn to you. Today is the day that I'm saved. And my life will never be the same. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. Can we give God some praise? How many received the word tonight? How many are ready to come back? This Sunday and next week, you're saying, I'm going to be here next week. Why don't we make a commitment to invite somebody? We need to invite friends and family this Sunday. We're going to receive a message on how to grow. And next Wednesday, we're going to continue this topic and we're going to dive deeper. Let's invite somebody next week. Let's pack this place out. Let's make sure there's not a seat available in this house so that someone can hear the truth about God's word. We love you so much, church. We know that if you, if you need any prayer... We have a team that's up here to pray with you. They're ready to pray with you, and we're ready to get you connected to your next step. If you came up for prayer, we want to ask you, don't leave without praying for someone. We made it a few more altar workers up here to help us connect and pray with somebody. So if you're altar trained, if you're a DG leader, we, want, we need your help. Come on up and help us. We need some help up here. We love you, church. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. If you need any help with anything, come on up. We'd love to pray with you and connect with you.